The Swiss concert promoter, Andy Piller, is the initiator and organizer of 7,000 tons of metal. Join Mark Lewis and ROA for an exclusive interview. Real rock and roll news. From the legends of rock, you found rockonamerica.live. We're bringing rock and roll to America and beyond. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. In the quaint Swiss town of Flums, a young man named Andy Piller began to organize concerts, little knowing it would become his life's work. The mastermind behind the epic 70,000 tons of metal, Piller has reimagined the concert experience. Imagine a five-day adventure in tropical weather surrounded by a global community of metal fans. 60 bands, countless amenities, and one unforgettable experience. 70,000 tons of metal has become a beacon for metal enthusiasts worldwide, standing the test of time as the longest-running cruise of its kind. It's outlived the likes of the Megadeth and Motorhead cruises, which couldn't make it past their maiden voyage. The 2023 edition saw the likes of Destruction, Dragon Force, Camelot, Creator, and Nightwish, among 55 other bands grace its stages. This is the power of passion, the magic of music, and the enduring legacy of 70,000 tons of metal. Join Rock on America Magazine and Mark Lewis' exclusive interview with Andy Piller. Hi, this is Mark with Rock over America Magazine, and today this is going to be a little different. I have an extreme pleasure to talk to Andy Piller, who you may or may not know the name, but you know the crew. The gentleman came up with a brilliant concept that had been done a little bit before, but not on this scale, not on this level. He is in charge of something that yet last year went off with, the next, with a great success, and it's called 70,000 Tons of Metal. It is the heaviest, biggest rock slash heavy metal slash music of any type cruise in the world. How are you doing, Andy? I'm fine. I'm fine. Pleasure to be with you. Well, pleasure to have you talking to me, too, for the magazine. I mean, when I first heard about that, and, um, one of my writers... I'm the guy that told you that I had a writer got sick and we had done a lot of talking last year back and forth by email and you're very, very nice. And you guys, all of your staff are very, very accommodating and wonderful, which first of all gives me the idea that the cruise and everybody is wonderful that's involved with the cruise. Anybody that would be booking this as a passenger or a band is just really going to have a wonderful experience. Because I think that uh, first of all, you have really great service where the people involved care and they get in touch. I think that's a good sign, first of all. Second of all, you came up with the, what would be considered probably the wildest, craziest, most innovative, interesting idea. 40, 40 heavy metal bands for four days in a cruise ship. One person has said to me, that's got to be utter pandemonium. And then I'm like, no, this has got to be great. And they can't leave. This is, this is awesome. You can hang out with the bands. You can see the bands. This is like the greatest concept in the world. So we'll kind of leave everything hang there, and we'll kind of go backwards and go forward. When you were a kid growing up, what did you listen to musically? Because I have a feeling that's going to have a lot of impact on that. Well, actually, actually, my interest in music was always uh, genre-wise pretty wide. Um, of course, I grew up with uh, a, lot of, a lot of heavy metal through my brother, which is six years older. Um, so yeah, with with stuff that was that was big in the eighties, you know, from Maiden to Queens to Scorpions, uh, except all those bands. But um, I I always I always also had an interest in other in other uh, genres of music, and uh, still listen to some of that stuff today. Some jazz, some classical music. Um, there is, so to speak, for me, there is no bad music. There is certainly some some stuff that I prefer and I like. But uh, there was no bad music. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. And that's kind of important because also I'm sure if you've been on... Were you on the cruise last year at all? Yes, I was. Uh, okay. You know this from talking to a lot of the artists. It's the same thing. Like John Oliva from Sabotage was the, the first... It was the second interview I ever did after uh, Marshall Lytle from Bill Haley's Comets and that I've ever done in my life. And he... We touched on that. Then I learned something that, what, and when understanding that the Beatles had been an influence, I had no clue that the Outlaws from Tampa, where he was living at the time as a kid, the Green Grass Night Heads Forever Southern Rock Band, would have been an influence and played 
started talking about the song Green Grass and High Tides Forever and started talking about the, the, the guitar riff, I'm going, wow, because I think a lot of people think, well, if you're a metal guy, you just like metal, and I'm sure that you found that too, and that's some pretty interesting conversations. A lot of metal guys like this and they like that. They're not just metal. It's a very, very diverse musical background. And I'm sure that had to make for interesting um, for, uh, conversations sometimes. And I'm sure also, you know, it's, it's interesting. And you've seen that like I have. It really impacts um, who they are musically, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, 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 it's actually something something nice and I think it's also it's also a general value uh, in the metal com community is, uh, is the open mindedness. Certainly you always find people that, that are just really uh, focused on, on one subgenre or, or, or not only music for, for things in life that they only they, they are single minded have only one interest but most most metal people they are, they are open to other things you know they uh, it's probably even even they will stick to a preferred to a preferred type of music, but um, they they can also live with other things. That's interesting and good, I think. Well, oh, absolutely. I think the diversity of the music enriches who they are musically too, and I think that when people really understand about this, because I think sometimes people, especially, don't know. Vlad is a heavy metal dude, you know. He doesn't have any background. It's really, really interesting to see who they are as people. I think sometimes, and this is kind of a really, really cool thing because you, you think, well, it's just a musician, it's just a star, and you've done something to it. Even if people don't understand you, they just put people in one, on one level or on a pedestal, they're going to come in here and see a diversity of backgrounds, musically speaking, a diversity of styles, and we're really going to have an understanding that these are just people, and it's very, very interesting, and... With, with that said, let's go from you growing up as a kid listening to music and a lot of metal and that. How do you go from there to coming up with the concept of this and then we're going to go straight into, like, I think we start with the selection process first from there. But what brought you in your life from being a little kid listening to music to uh, doing 70,000 tons of metal? Well, as a teenager, um, when I was in high school already, there was, uh, where we lived there, there was a youth club where I was uh, pretty engaged um, and like organizing small concerts of local bands. Um, and it kind of grew from there. Later later in college, I, I started to organize some bigger shows um, and uh, have actually um, spent my entire working career in the music industry the first 10 years as a, as a local promoter uh, back in Europe, in Switzerland, where I grew up. Um, and from there, slipped kind of into a booking agent, uh, tour promoter role, and then did more, more and more going out in the road myself, did some tour management for you, almost 10 years. Can you mention some of the bands you did tour management for and booking for? Yeah, I mean, some, some American bands, like Overkill, um, like Annihilator, and um, tons, tons of Scandinavian, mainly death metal bands. Because that was uh, in the 90s, so when when that became really big, um, some of the partners, managements, and, uh, and agencies that I worked together with, they were really engaged overall in the in the dance, dance so growing that metal scene. So that was where I worked lot. But again, you know, overall when I when I not as promoter so much, but when I was uh, going out as a higher talent as a tour manager, I worked with all kinds of other artists too. I actually did a tour one time with a reggae artist and stuff like this, you know, which was quite interesting. But it was mainly metal, I would say probably 90% metal. Okay, so how do you go, so what gave you the idea and the concept to uh, put this on? Is this really as good, like, what was it? There was a cruise like a year or two years before that, and I think Tess, I want to say Tess was on it, I can't remember, but it was six hair, what would be considered, quote, hair metal bands, hair rock bands. Um, well, in general, the, the, the whole concept of the music group is not something totally new, although right. in, in other genres, um, that mainly cater to an older and also more affluent crowd in general, especially jazz, blues, 
also classical music, that kind of stuff, those type of cruises, they're around almost as long as the cruise industry is around, you know. You have this for 30 years or more. Um, then there were some, there were some, some other promoters, mainly in Scandinavia, that did stuff like this, also with heavy metal, but on a smaller scale, like mainly on, on ferries, um, from Sweden to Finland, uh, to Norway, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, there were also in America people that did kind of rock, hard rock cruises and doing them. However, the main difference of, of most all of them is that they, um, they are just a group on a ship. So mm -hmm. it's a couple of hundred or probably yeah. up to thousand people um, that are uh, on the ship with regular cruise guests or with other groups. So that's the, that's the main and big difference of what we're doing. I mean, we have the whole ship to ourselves, you know. So you do not uh, share the vessel with people that are actually not part of this whole happening. Right. Did, you, did anybody tell you doing 40 bands for four days was too much of an undertaking? For, for almost everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because when I heard that, I'm like, this is the good. It was really, this is my reaction. I was like, my eyes got big, and I'm like, this is the coolest thing I've ever heard of. This is awesome. Um, the thing is, it, it may or may not would have worked with, with less artists, but yeah. so would have worked with 20, but um, it, was, it was my intention from the beginning on to, uh, to set the stakes high and overall to create this very unique atmosphere that you have when you have so many artists on board. Imagine 40 bands and average with five guys in the band, so it's 200 positions. You got 2,000 tickets to sell, so that's a ratio of 1 to 10. Yeah. That, that, that creates something very special compared to other shows of festival where that ratio is much, much higher, you know. So having probably only 15 or 20 bands on board would probably not have done the same, the same thing. Probably would have, we don't know, but um, I mean the success actually proves, proves the concept right. Oh, absolutely, and you had, you had a diversity of bands because you had last year everything from, like, um, Raven to Obituary. So what is the selection process like for a band? Can you take us from the start to finish because I'm sure you've got phone calls. Um, and if you have a minute, I need to ask you a question when we're done too off the record. But um, yeah, I'm sure you get, like, phone calls uh, from, like, management or record labels maybe dance and they're on their own. So if I'm a band, let's let's say that um you know, the Metal Kings and I want to get on the cruise and I've been recording for a while and I've done some tours and I and, and I've decided because I'm I'm gonna help my manager out. What's the process that the that the band goes through from start to finish so that we understand how the bands are chosen? Well, I mean we we made kind of a wish list, um, where I put some bands on, some of my partners put some bands on, um, some of our media and press partners probably, probably throw in some ideas, um, and um, then, I mean, I'm talking now about more about PR artists, you know, right. um, and um, we then we, we, uh, we communicate, of course, also with lots of the, uh, of the artist management and um, their, their booking agents, and to a certain extent also with some record labels. Um, what's available? What's available? Because sometimes bands, even if they want to, they're simply not available because they're already um, confirmed for other tours, you know, their record cycle, they're in the studio, studio time, whatever, you know. Oh yeah. Um, so that's that, and um, yeah, then then of course, like we usually approach those artists via their via their business uh, representatives. And, um, yeah, depending on interest. Some people simply don't want to do that, you know. Um, it's not everybody's thing to be locked up in a cruise ship for four days. Um, even though nobody got, got mobbed or whatever, you know. Uh, nobody was camping in front of somebody else's cabin, you know, to get, to get, to get an autograph or that kind of stuff. Um, but some people probably are more of a shy nature or whatever. And, um, don't don't want to be put in that, into that environment, and that we have to accept. But it's only got a few. Okay. And um, 
what was the, what was it like last year? Take us to the thing for when somebody would would get down to Fort Lauderdale, they would check in to the uh, moment they would leave. Give us kind of an idea. We can just do like a one day like a one day on the ship. They cruise in, they check in the first day, and what's kind of like the process like? And then what do they experience on a typical day on the cruise? Well, um, we like that we will also leave next January for Miami, not for Lauderdale. Okay. You know, it's almost the same. Right. Um, well, you arrive at the point, you drop off your your luggage, um, kind of a similar thing than when you board a plane. You you don't carry your luggage yourself on. You drop it off. You can, you can of course, always take a carry-on, but then you have to carry them around. Because um, once you get on the ship, your um, cabin may or may not be already ready. Um, your luggage, of course, will be will be delivered to your cabin. And um, well, once you're on the ship, uh, you know that all all the the meals, all food, is um, is included in the price. So you can go and uh, uh, get stuffed if you want. And you can go up on the pool deck and and see see how we're finishing to build to build the stage up there, stuff like this. Um, and um, shortly after departure, um, when we're in international waters, all the shows will start. We have three stages on board, um, one in the main theater, one that we built outside on the pool deck, and uh, one in a smaller lounge. And um, yeah, some, some performances will overlap um, in course of the four days, but since every artist plays twice, you get a fair chance to see every band at these spots if you really want to do so. Nice. And generally, what time does the band start performing, and how long do uh, what what the time does generally the last band play? Well, um, the first day, the departure day, um, where we where we last year, there, there were some unfortunate things that happened when we were loading because there was a police funeral in Miami that delayed a lot of things, so the departure was actually slightly delayed. Normally. Uh, departure should be at 5, the first band should be on at 7 on a departure day. Um, and that goes, the last bands go on stage around 3 o'clock, so last live performance will be over at 4. However, we still do have, after that, um, metal karaoke um, in, one of the, in one of the bars. Um, we also um, have um, open mic sessions where you can probably where some of the guests can actually probably jam around with some of the artists too. And um, on the second day, which is a whole day on sea, it will start much earlier. So first dance will start around 10 o'clock in the morning, going again until deep into the night. Um, and then on the way back, uh, it'll be the same thing because for, for the third day, you're at a destination. Last time we were in Cozumel, Mexico. This time we'll be in uh, Georgetown, Cayman Islands. Um, we'll leave again in the evening, and then the whole thing happens again, like on the way to go. So, shows until 4 in the morning, then a whole day again with shows from 10 in the morning until 4. Does anybody get any sleep on the ship at all? <laughs> Not very much. That was good to say. I have a question too. Now this is a little bit different, but there are going to be a lot of people wondering, and I have to renew mine in case it was needed. So I think it's a good question. Let's say somebody wanted to come on the cruise ship and they had no intention of the, of getting off the ship because they're like, oh, it's metal, dude. I don't care what's there. I don't care what's on metal. This is not going to compete with this. I'm not setting foot off the ship. Period. And they don't leave. Do they still need a passport for this cruise? No, they don't. Um, you, I mean, if you're talking about U.S. citizens. Um, yeah, U.S. citizens. I mean, I mean, if you, if you travel internationally, you always need a passport to get into the U.S. Uh, first, of course. But um, no, you don't need you don't need a passport if you don't want to go if, if you don't want to get off um, at the destination. Which actually, I would. It's hard to count. I would have to look into into manifests and stuff. But I I believe that less than half of the guests actually um, debark the vessel at the port of call that we're doing. Lots of people they need to sleep down that day, or they have a hangover anyway, so they just stay on board, hang out, eat, drink again, whatever you know. Yeah. Besides on that, I mean, this is the only opportunity to see forty metal bands. I mean, I don't 
think if I was if I if me on there, I'm not leaving. I, I don't care if you have naked women at the at, at the destination. I'm sure I'm going to see something. Somebody go crazy on the ship. But anyways, but I mean, you can see a trip. You can see an island anytime. This you don't see. So I think I, I, that's what I was wondering. But for me, I would never leave the ship. Well, I mean, it's, you can probably also leave the ship with some of your favorite artists together. Um, last year, a couple of a couple of the bands um, they they booked a certain short excursion excursion in uh, in uh, in Cozumel, and um, lost their fans and went along. And, I mean, that's also a very special experience because, yeah, in the end, all the artists on board are guests. Too. And they they actually accept that the time that they are performing, um, they're like everyone else on board. You know, they use the same bars, the same restaurants. They go everywhere where everyone else goes. So they're also vacationing. You know. Nice. And um, so what is, is are there like autograph signings there? Or is it just kind of really informal? And if you wanted to meet, like like let's say I was there last year and I wanted to just kind of meet and hang out with Raven. What would I do? I would just kind of like find them and just kind of hang out with them, or are there structured things set up to like I wanted to bring all my albums, they signed the albums, do signing, how do things like that work? Um, overall, so to create a more relaxing environment for everyone, uh, for the artists and for the fans alike, we set up an official signing autograph meeting week session with every artist, you know. So if you want to bring your seven albums of, of artist X, Y, and want to have them autographed by everyone, you don't have to run around three days on the boat signing everyone, you know. So you just take them to the scheduled autograph signing session and you get it done there. So it's less stress for you as the guest, it's also less stress for the artist because they're not part of left and right. If you just want to hang out with them, as I said, they are guests like everyone else. So they eat at the same restaurants, they drink at the same bars, uh, they sit in the same lounges. Well, don't be shy, just talk to them, you know. And um, if you if you have a, a normal sense, you, you feel very quick if somebody is like into a chat or if somebody is probably already did it with someone else, you know. I'd like to ask two more questions, and then I want to give all the information out, all the contact information, the price, and if that's okay, if we have time for that. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, what was the most, for you, what was the most interesting thing that you saw about this cruise that you weren't really thinking about when you got on there and the experiences? What was the thing, what was the wow factor where you go, wow, I didn't realize this was going to happen, this was really cool? It's very hard to say, to, to, to pick out one specific moment, you know. Um, it was, it was the whole thing. I mean, I spent around four years of my life before, before the inaugural sailing, um, thinking up this whole idea, uh, building it all, you know. So you have played more or less every eventuality through in your mind. It was more when, when we actually left uh, when I when I felt the ship moving, I ran up on on the on the top deck and had like my two minutes and and seeing seeing uh, the Miami skyline become smaller and smaller, I had to go down again and continue continue to get everything ready. Um, <coughs> so so that was the moment for me. It wasn't like a wall that I didn't expect or so, because we didn't know what to expect anyway. <laughs> so right. And this is going to be a two-part question, Andy. The first thing is I'm going to build off this for, for something for this year. Um, what was kind of an overwhelm, over, um, overall response that you got from people where it was, there was maybe a theme or a couple different themes where people had been given feedback and they go, this was the thing that was the favorite part of the cruise for us. What, for a lot of people, what would something like that be? The favorite, the favorite thing for the favorite, for like for, for not, maybe not the band so much, but the people that were booking to go. What was what was one of the big things that would turn out to be a favorite for a lot of the uh, cruisers? Well, it was it was like recreating that that extremely international, multicultural um, atmosphere that you have in some of the of the very large European open air metal festivals on a much smaller scale, you know. So, 
So I think I think this is this is what would lot appreciate it. Uh, and not only that that it was so international, also that all these people that are actually into different subgenres of metal, um, anyway, all hang out together, all party together. It's funny that sometimes you have um, people that on our discussion forum uh, message board or Facebook or whatever, they're kind of um, fighting over over music uh, styles um, and certain bands the whole year long. But afterwards, you have them for four days in the ship and uh, uh, drinking and partying together. Nice. That's very, that's, that's, that's very cool. Yeah. It's kind of like being at a high rock concert on basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because like Kate, that, that's the one for Kate, and I'll go, Okay, you guys are fighting, shake hands. Don't fight physically. Fight over your favorite metal bands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is one thing that you can talk about this year to give kind of a prelude that you guys have decided to do different that all the people that book, or, or most of the people that book anyways, are going to get really, really excited about that? You, one thing that you can share one little tidbit that maybe is going to be a little bit different this year. Well, in general, in general, um, don't fix something that is not broken. You always say. Um, so there will not be there will not be anything majorly different. There is there is some things that w- that w- of course um, we can improve uh, production wise. Um, the guest will not feel that much about it. I know there is there is lots of impact for, uh, a lot of input coming from from our guests uh, that want this and this and that. Um, so they want to have a larger beer selection. Um, we will definitely. This is this was one of the things where we were limited last time, but very much through the concessionary of the of the cruise line that has exclusive uh, sales rights for for um, non food and drink articles. We we will make try our best to make improvements in on the merchandise. Um, and yeah, probably some some other some other non live performance. Um, uh, parts of the cruise, maybe some more um, workshops or clinics with some of the artists, stuff like this. Um, but overall, overall, there are some production, some production issues that we can streamline. Um, it's all a learning curve for everyone, of course, when you do something the first time. But that will probably not so much impact the guest itself. Okay, and let me do it this way first. Any media that want to specifically contact to be there to cover the uh, cruise, how do they, we'll do it this way first because all promotion is a good thing and we need to get the word out as much as possible. And you guys have been so very, very helpful and, you know, courteous and wonderful with this, you know, just everything. Uh, first of all, how does the media, if any media are listening to this, they want to be able to book the cruise, um, and what would be the process for me to they need the press credentials and photo passes and other things? Well, um, principally, of course, since we are on a ship and it's, uh, it, there is a limited capacity, every bunk can only go, uh, they get used once, um, whether it goes revenue or non-revenue, there is not a simple guest list like you have this on a normal show, you know. Um, but um, we, have, we have media contacts on our website. Um, there is there is a, there is a section for media where they can get in contact with us and write with the with the responsible people and um, yeah pitch ideas you know say what you want to do and uh, we look over it and we see what we can do um, and um, I can speak from personal experience you guys are the, some of the easiest people to work with you just wonderful thank you very much so yeah I mean like. If any media wants to come on and 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 uh, uh, can want to uh, um, feature some coverage, you know, uh, get in contact with us and we see what we can do, what makes sense for everyone. Now I want to say this for the regular people, for the fans that are going to be on it. I had a, I had a writer that got extremely sick, had a bad medical condition. I don't know if you remember that last year, but he had a really extremely bad medical condition. I don't want to go into on here. And you were you personally were very very helpful in trying to help me get the money refunded for him. And that shows a level of customer service and going beyond customer service being helpful, but in a lot of times just on trips and things you don't get. So anybody listening to this that's going to book, 
understand that you're working, you're going to be booking with some of the best people out there, period, that will just go out of their way to be helpful. So with that said, where does the, where does the regular fan, what's the process from? Let's get the website first of all. Um, well, people people can can start the booking process either by by filling out the appropriate fields on the on the booking uh, page of our website, or simply calling our our ticketing hotline and can start the process from there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean we have we have uh, uh, double, triple, and quad cabins. Uh, I correct me, we don't have any quad cabins anymore. They're already sold out. Um, and uh, we also, we also, because there was quite some requests last year, we also sell this year single tickets uh, in shared cabins. You know, there is a there is a small fee for for that because it's more work. But if you don't have anybody to go along with you, you want to come along. You seem, you always can can book a single ticket, and you get matched up with um, other people from anywhere, but of the same genre. Uh, so people that that we will match up together, we only put boys with boys and girls with girls, you know. So. Do you feel like the Slayer fan with like the Bon Jovi fan? Do you ever do that? Or you try to match them up musically too? Uh, we don't do that because we don't ask. <laughs> we don't ask for their preferences when we're booking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, we didn't have any problems, you know. So uh, yeah, I mean everybody, everybody was 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 happy so far. And um, uh, lots of people that that uh, are shy of the extra fee. There is there is enough social media nowadays out there. We also have a section on our on our um, discussion forum where people get in contact with other single travelers and like this fill up a cabin and book it together. You know, if you don't have anybody. Got it. Now let's say somebody. Does, let, let's go to the ticketing prices really quickly. It starts. 666, is that kind of off number of the beast? Is that just kind of done as a tongue-in-cheek joke? And everybody knows that when people talk about gen- metal general as a whole, they go, oh, it's that devil music. Is that, yeah, yeah, is that yeah, kind yeah. of a running joke? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, that's hysterical. It's, it's fitted more or less into the into the whole pricing scheme that, that uh, we, we calculated anyway. So it was kind of a no-brainer to do that, you know. Yeah, so it starts there with, uh, if I have this right, the taxes work out to start out um, per double occupancy for, per person, 666 plus a 249 fee. Where does pricing go for there? And let's talk about, first of all, the person that's not going to be able to find anybody to go with them and they have to pay an extra fee. What, can you talk about what that extra fee is? Um, actually, the, um, the the taxes and fees portion this year is two eighty nine. Two eighty nine, okay. And, um, because because uh, and actually we're eating there already apart because port taxes overall in Miami <coughs> they they uh, went up drastically. Um, the single the single passenger fee uh, and the single ticketing fee is uh, is a hundred dollars. You know? So if you don't have anybody to book with you and you don't want to find people yourself over Facebook or whatever, um, then and you want to book a single ticket, it's $100 extra. That's actually a really, really good deal, too. And then for the remaining um, um, yeah, the pricing uh, up to the, um, the triple cabins, because you said the quadro book, what would the pricing be for everybody? Um, well, the, the average, I mean, lots of the, lots of the cheaper, <coughs> lots of the cheaper cabin categories are already sold out. Well, anyway, um, like over 70% sold already this year now. Um, but um, in general, the pricing for the standard cabins for the interior quad starts at 666, as you mentioned before, per person, and it goes up to uh, $1,400 per person for standard cabins, you know. Okay. Um, and then there is there is a very selected number of, of luxury accommodation, like suites and stuff, that, that come at a higher price. Okay, and what else that maybe you haven't had a chance to interview as we wrap this up? Have, have you wanted to let people know about this that you never had an opportunity to uh, let everybody know that they really need to know about the cruise? Well, something we had many opportunities to, to, to point it out. However, some people, they have not, still not understood it. Um, 
what people should know overall about pricing and, and, and booking is um, you have the possibility um, if you think it's a steep price to pay it in installments. So you actually only pay 25% when you're booking and then you pay a quarter each following month. Um, that makes it a little bit easier for some people. Um, and um, other than that, yeah, look fast because it's selling out fast, you know. Absolutely, and let's go ahead and give out all the, let's give out the website to the main site, and then is the Facebook and everything connected to that too? Yeah, you have, you have on the main, on the main start homepage of the website, you have links to our Facebook um, um, page, and um, also to some of the other social media, to our, to our discussion forum and so on. Uh, website is very simple, 70,000tons.com. Okay, and what is the band so far of all those that are booked that you're really, really excited about so far that you see? Well, <laughs> well one that you thought, wow, I never maybe thought I'd get to see this. This is going to be good. One that you're really excited about. Um, it's actually an, an, a, a question that I cannot ask. Like, okay. Usually I, I will never get the time while I'm on the cruise to really see the band. At least that's like... <laughs> Got you. And I, I want to say thank you, Andy. This has been a pleasure. Can we also do this again um, before the ticketing um, fills up and do this maybe in a couple of months when we're time to do a little bit more promotion for this? Sure, absolutely. And then you can give everybody, so we can do, use this also for maybe do a 15 minute interview as a follow up, and you can also give some updates for everybody too. We'll do that. Okay, I am going to just hang on one second. I'm going to say interview over.